In preparing for this panel, I was reading the reviews of, of what's called COP21, and a line that was constantly repeated was, this has given us more reason to celebrate than any previous climate summit. And I thought about that for a second, and I thought, one, that's nice, and two, that's a pretty low bar. Um, the fact is, if every country meets the pledges they made in Paris, we're still likely to fall very short of the goal of keeping uh, global warming below two degrees Celsius uh, over the next few decades. Uh, so every country committed at COP21 needs to keep improving plans, and we need some big technology breakthroughs. And then when you look at the US, um, well, I'd say that we don't exactly have a consensus on how to deal with climate, and our political response over the years has been pretty volatile, and we're a critical actor to actually getting the right outcome here. So what we'd like to do for the next 30 minutes is delve into what ought to happen and what's likely to happen under various scenarios and kind of share a bit about what it means for business and to do that, as you heard from Brian, we have a terrific panel. I won't, I won't reintroduce them, but I will start by just diving in with Steve Chu to my right. Um, so two thumbs up on COP21, and what do we tell the next administration, whoever he or she may be? Well, very briefly, yes, two thumbs up. That's the good news. The bad news is even if we achieve two degrees before the Industrial Revolution, it's really scary. I want to spend 20 seconds telling you that if we go one degree higher than we are today, um, the long-term prospect is about six meters to nine meters higher sea level in a couple of hundred years. That we know from history. So six to nine meters higher, uh, which is about 10 meters is 10% uh, of the population, 8% of the world population lives within 10 meters of sea level. So even one degree has long-term very bad repercussions. So, but, let's get, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't work as much as we can and what we have to do. So it is a two thumbs up, but um, really, in the end, it's what we actually do, not as an agreement of a UN negotiation, but we act, what we actually do uh, in each country and how we actually uh, work to mitigate carbon emissions. The adaptation is also important, but it's hard to think of adapting to a 10 meter higher sea level. So what's the, so what are your sort of three priorities for the next administration? Um, take full advantage of the fact that renewable energy costs are diving. Uh, just very recently, Mexico uh, had a power auction. Uh, it was 40, 40 point, zero, $40.5 dollars per megawatt hour, 4.05 cents per kilowatt hour. No solar investment tax credit, no subsidies like that. It includes the profit of the investment. Uh, Abu Dhabi just had a, a solar investment auction. Uh, it's uh, 2.99 cents per kilowatt hour, including profit. And so how do we take advantage of these rapidly plunging prices? And it's mostly going to be in electricity transmission distribution, a, a system that can actually go from 10% to 20% to 50% renewables. There are countries in Europe already that are 50% renewables and intermittent renewables. Hydro doesn't count, but intermittent renewables. Uh, the United States is far behind in incorporating that technology. We've got to catch up, and that's the first thing we can do is take advantage of these plunging prices. Okay. Jim, um, let me just, let's just go around quickly. We can come back, but um, to, what do you, what's your, your view on Paris? Big deal, no big deal? And again, what would you advise our policymakers starting in November 2016? Well, I guess I'd say that uh, there's more than meets the eye in Paris and there's less than meets the eye. So I'm kind of a thumbs up and a thumbs sideways uh, on Paris. Uh, the thumbs up is we finally got everyone together, finally got a document uh, in place. Uh, it was largely modeled on work that uh, we had done when I, was in the, when I was in the government back in 2007. And so if you look at the arc of what occurred in Paris, it was the arc of actually quite bipartisan accomplishment. Uh, so that's very good. And it had China and India and a whole raft of other important countries specifically delineating commitments and plans. So that's, and that was thought to be not possible. We have it. Um, the thumb sideways um, it has two essential problems in it. So, one, with respect to the major developing economies, the Chinas, the Indias, the Brazils, the South Africas, the Mexicos of the world, uh, there's no teeth in Paris, so it's only as good as their will. And if you've ever been to China or India lately, which I have often, um, that will is still significantly lacking. Uh, lifting people out of poverty is a very important thing, and we should all share that. That's largely being driven by fossil 
Okay? And so you still have this trade-off between poverty eradication, industrial growth, and emissions control. And I don't see scalable, sustained commitments yet. I hear a lot of voices, but not commitments. On the developed country, it's the other, it's the other side of the coin, which is we're missing out still. We're, we're short on R&D and acceleration of R&D into the marketplace. And then we're also way short on the proven technologies that we can all safely do, which is nuclear, which is proven. It, it can be affordably put in the mix. And yet, the major developed countries are backing out of it. I don't get to two degrees unless I'm accelerating uh, the, the clean tech innovation and I'm accelerating the reintroduction of nuclear in the developed world and then inspire China in to do the same. So well framed, a lot of follow ups got to occur. So just a quick check on that. So, uh, nuclear, do, raise your hand if you all agree we need to accelerate nuclear as part of the uh, solution. OK, so I thought we had a consensus. OK, <laughs> so the audience is raised. Good, I like that participation. Um, David, uh, and again, I'm going to come back to say uh, Jim's point uh, is very well taken about what other countries do. But part of our discussion is the US has got to set the example. And we made a bunch of commitments in Paris to lower our path by 2025, to spend more money on R&D, and uh, to fund the Green Climate Initiative, several big pledges from President Obama. So what do we do in the US to, to hit those? Or are those the right things to emphasize? Uh, thanks, Rick. Thanks to Fortune. Each of you has mentioned the two degree C goal. Let me just start with a small point and ask the <laughs> audience, how many of you feel confident that you can convert centigrade to Fahrenheit? <laughs> okay, so let me note, here we are at the Fortune E conference, an audience self-selected for their interest and expertise on this topic. About half of the hands just went up. Okay? We're here in the United States of America, where people think in Fahrenheit. I think for everybody who is talking about global warming, I highly recommend you take the pledge. If you talk about centigrade, also use Fahrenheit. 3.6, by the way. Thank you. But for <laughs> those of you who are wondering, the conversion is 9 fifths, so 2 degrees, 9 to 5, so, so uh, 2 degrees C is 3.6 degrees F. And actually, this matters from a communication standpoint, I believe, because when Americans hear that temperatures might rise by 2 degrees C, Undoubtedly, the vast majority are thinking about that as two degrees up. So, small point. Back to Paris. I think 100, here's what's significant about Paris 150 heads of state came to Paris, the largest gathering of heads of state ever outside New York. Not a single one of them questioned the science of climate change or questioned the need to do anything about it. There is an overwhelming global political consensus on this issue, as well as an overwhelming scientific consensus on this issue. You asked about what the next president needs to do, Rick. The next president needs to embrace that consensus, that global consensus, and pursue policies to respond to the challenge. Now, we can get to this. Unfortunately, the presumptive nominee of one of our major political parties says that global warming is a hoax. In fact, he says that it is a hoax by the Chinese uh, in order to undercut American manufacturing, which is kind of an interesting in a number of different layers. But, <laughs> but the he said that was, he's, he's since said that was a joke, but I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> he, he's I think also, he still says it's a hoax, so. Right, so I, I believe he does. Um, so the most important thing the president can do is adopt policies to, um, to address the challenge and to speak about it robustly to the American people. I think those policies will include policies in the coal sector, decline, uh, defending the clean power plan, um, policies to reduce methane emissions, which are very potent, um, po policies to uh, improve energy efficiency, particularly in the midterm CAFE review. That's going to be an extremely important set of policies. Um, uh, a set of policies that don't get enough attention are around HFCs, a super pollutant with enormous global warming potential that we need to work with global partners on to reduce, and we can go on. So, Jim, let me just come back to you. Um, ha having served eight years under President George W. Bush, you were going to speak for the Republican Party. So is there a, um, <laughs> is there a leave aside the presumptive nominee and what he does or doesn't make up his mind to do should he have the office, is there some, what's the framework for some common ground where we can move together here? You see one? Yeah, I do. Um, uh, and every 15, 20 years or so, things come together to create that common ground. And I think we're at that moment. Um, first, an incoming president has a lot of political capital, uh, you know, regardless of who he or she is. They come in, they got a lot of energy, uh, and, and they got to hit the ground running, especially in this subject matter. Your first 18 to 24 months are it until you get to the backside. It's quite simple, it's well proven. And so we're really looking at that 18 to 24 month window of a new presidency. 
The other thing is, um, I remember George W. would say all the time, Jimmy, we're not playing small ball. So if you're going to do something, you've got to do big and bold. And here's the big and bold. First, which is the most bold, I'll get to big in a second, we have to push the Congress to debate and resolve how far, how fast on carbon abatement. Hmm. That's big and bold. And that's all they're resolving. They're not putting in place legislation. They're not doing anything else. They're agreeing on what the number is. And either they're accepting the, the number out of Paris or they're not. I actually don't care as long as the number is down. Hmm. Capital planners around the world, if they see American, the American legislature committing to a number that is down, you're going to unleash a lot of investment and opportunity here. I'll note, Paris was agreed to. How much did the market move? Nothing. OK, so something else has to happen if this is real, because the market gave it a big yawn. Okay, so that's one, and that's bold. Do it fast, get it over with. Then there are three baskets of hugely scalable opportunity that can be attractive to conservatives. One, uh, we are awash in a maze of mandates. Believe it or not, there's over 100 federal and state mandates governing CO2 emissions to one degree or another, all passed bipartisan. Okay? But they overlap, they conflict, they're impossible to plan against. I know because I'm, I'm an executive who has to deal with this. It's impossible to plan against. State by state, federal, what have you. And it's constantly changing. So regulatory simplification, that's the deal that can be had. Okay? Let's disagree on, on how much it's a problem or not a problem. We don't have to resolve that. We can agree that this maze of mandates is a mess. Let's simplify it. And by the way, the candidates are saying they want regulatory reform. Simplification. So I would reduce down to a very simple market-based mandate on power, a very uh, elegant set of market-based mandates on transportation and fuels. We know how to do it. The three of us could get in a room in 48 hours and pencil this out. It's a question of political will, but boy, would it help. On the other side are the incentives. We incentivize everything. It's crony capitalism you know, to, the end, to the nth degree. And if everybody gets an incentive to accomplish the same thing, then nobody's being incentivized to do anything. So I, it's, I think you can simplify the incentives, in fact, get them down to zero, take half of the savings, and put it into R&D. OK, you could quintuple so, so get rid of the, the R&D budget. Get rid of subsidies, you're saying. Get rid of all the subsidies, fossil and renewable. Just phase them down on a okay. predictable schedule and combine them. But then the third and the biggest one that no one's talking about is follow the money. We're about to embark in tax reform one way or the other, and it's not carbon tax, which I think is a dumb idea. But a very good idea is expensing, lower the corporate tax rate so American companies have more money to spend on innovation, deployment of new technologies, and to turn over their capital stock, and repatriate the trillions of dollars that our biggest innovators have overseas, repatriate that to America so it will be spent in America on clean tech. That is bigger than anything else I just mentioned. It will scale us faster than anything else I just mentioned. So uh, responses, Stephen? I mean, what's... Well, I, I partially agree that um, there are many, many overlapping things that we can simplify. Um, I, I don't agree that we... Uh, I do agree that we will need a carbon tax. But if you have a carbon tax, you can replace a lot of other uh, incentives and disincentives. And so there, we, if we meet in behind the room, we can hatch that one out. Just <laughs> to be clear, Jay, did you, were you saying you wouldn't do a carbon tax? Or you saying I, I would not. I mean, I've not. got That's seven reasons why it's a stupid idea. Okay. I just, You're I just, simplifying the mandates, make them market-based, okay. okay? I just wanted to make sure. I think, I think there's too many reasons why every minute spent right. talking about a carbon tax is a minute not advancing a, okay. com, a, a okay. shared set of so solutions. Back, so back but to but, but uh, so uh, this would not be on the agenda of either of the either, either can, exactly. Uh, that's a true too. So, 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 again, so, so given that and being realistic, what we, you know, go back to the other things we can do. I agree wholeheartedly that R and D, especially transformative R and D, the kind of R and D that, for example, RPU was founded on, it, it could be really game changing, and and not to deploy technologies that sort of work but don't really work well enough that you can see it widely deployed uh, to drive down the, the, the so cost. So what do we need? Do we need the, I mean, the president talking about doubling, was it six billion something now? Do we need to go to 20? Do we need to? Well, um, actually you go one and a half times and you have it wi more wisely spent. Uh, you know, That's enough. When, when David and I were in the Department of Energy, some people came up to me and said, what about the solar program? Did you double the budget? He said, no, we didn't increase it at all. He says, Wow, it's having much more impact. You can spend it more wisely, whatever money you have. Yep. 
Uh, and so I think that is, but, but, but the new technology that, that people can, industries can take and, and startup companies can take and run with. Which, one, which, what, which technology are you particularly excited oh, about? Uh, there are many, many technologies. <laughs> can, can, you, can you focus well, on a couple? I'll, I'll tell you what I'm working on uh, besides the biology medicine stuff. I'm, I'm working on a battery that could really, um, this is lithium metal, sulfur, and a three-dimensional geometry. Maybe you have 10 times the charging rate. Uh, maybe five times the energy density uh, at, at very low cost. Now, if you can get that, we don't have that. It's not off the shelf. But if you can get that, then you get the $20,000 Tesla. Nope. They can go 250 miles. It's something like that. We're, so there are many, many things, new things on high voltage that can make transmission distribution. You, you, you generate renewables where it's the lowest cost and put it where, where the people are. There are many, many things uh, that one can do in order to dramatically lower the cost of a low carbon uh, economy. So David, I'm going to go to you, and then I want to open it up to the audience. Um, this notion of, uh, you can respond to anything Jim said, but also just this notion that we sh it looks like we should have a consensus for more spending on some technology breakthroughs. Uh, yeah. Certainly the president committed us, and it, it feels like there might be some bipartisan ground. What, what, what would you be putting your chips on? I mean, I just, first I want to applaud the constructive spirit of Jim's remarks, and I wish you were negotiating for the other side of the aisle on all these issues, Jim. I, I think we could, we could get a lot done. I, I do, and I, I also applaud the regulatory simplification as an objective. I do think this problem is much bigger than that. I don't think we're going to get very far in terms of carbon abatement with regulatory simplification. And, and I would also just note a tension between two of your comments, which you might want to comment, um, which, which is on the one hand the support for nuclear power and its development, and the second hand the call to end all subsidies. I mean, I, I am strongly for nuclear power um, research and trying to advance it, bring down costs, and develop passively safe nuclear power systems and figuring out how we do life extension on nuclear power plants. I don't see a vision of the nuclear power industry in this country or around the world that doesn't include subsidies like Price Anderson or Loan Guarantee Program or a variety of other subsidies that are, that are pretty central to, to, to the industry. Um, uh, with respect to um, the, the, tech, the investments you asked about, Rick, you know, this mission innovation announcement happened, which was made at Paris, is a really important announcement. 20 countries got together and said they were going to double clean energy R&D over five years. That, that creates a lot of potential um, for new investment. That investment is only going to have an impact if the results of the R&D actually get to the marketplace. And, and so at the same time, Bill Gates and a group of 27 billionaires yeah. came to, or high net worth individuals came together and said they were going to help provide that channel. Um, I think it's very important that a structure be developed to get the results from the research labs of governments to, to, to commercialization. To and, deployment out market. Yeah, right. to go into that market, yeah. Well, that thing is called the market. Um, <laughs> uh, look you, around. How many flat panel monitors do you see? At one point in time, 10 years ago, gremlins came along and took away all the lead CRTs and all of a sudden populated the earth with flat panel monitors. Uh, higher value product, uh, actually at a higher cost, believe it or not, with higher level amenities, displaced a very significant environmental transgressor. Um, and that plays out again and again and again. Um, and so I, I completely agree with what you're saying, David, and, and what Steve's after. But in order for that, even the Gates and the billionaire money to deploy, I mean, how is it we're relying on a bunch of billionaires to somehow be the saviors of this? Um, in order for that to occur, you need strong, clean, clear, uninterruptible signals that are not played with by politicians and are not played with by, um, uh, by all the people who want their share versus the other guy. And we've done it in every other sector. By the way, we did it with air pollution on power plants before we didn't do it on carbon, unfortunately. Uh, we did it with fisheries. We've done it in aviation. Uh, we've done it in pretty much every other sector in America. We know how to get ubiquity of this technological transformation. We have to clean up the policy shop. And if you don't do that, everything else is just going to be a permission-based system of innovation taking longer than we want at higher, high, higher, higher cost than we want. OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that and let the audience ask some questions. Right up here in the front, please identify yourself and try to keep the questions short and pointed. Certainly. Michael Mollick, Sunlink Corporation. Jim, my question is to you on the market forces as opposed to a carbon tax. You just heard the cost of solar energy. It's lower than gas, any form or modality of energy generation. So how can you make that statement? I don't understand. Because otherwise, well, we'd have solar would be proliferating just 
100% across the board. Yes, yeah, solar still has its fundamental issues of intermittency, right? And it's part of a system that is massively regulated. So one of the, I mean, if you want to be bold, okay, is we need to go back to the future and finish the job of restructuring the electricity markets in America. Okay, now you want to unleash renewables, you put that then against a clear market-based simpler mandate, okay, you're going to have as much solar as the market will take, right, at that incremental cost of value, plus it's, it's contributor to the different periods of time in the electricity system. But the beauty of it is we need to unleash the innovation inside of utilities. They are, they are working with a, with a very comfortable business model, okay, with which, by the way, I think they do a really good job, but their incentives are skewed. We need to give our utility executives and their shareholders a new set of incentives. And they'll deliver just as reliably and safely as they do today. That's why we rely on them. But right now, they can't move because they're given a government-directed, permission-based system of deployment of clean tech. They can't make a move without getting permission. That doesn't happen in, 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 in IT. It, as I said, it doesn't happen in aviation as much anymore. It doesn't happen in all the sectors that we live and breathe in. And yet, this is the one sector that somehow everyone needs permission to succeed. I find it fascinating. Okay. David? Um, let me respectfully disagree. <laughs> I, thought you were. Uh, I mean, the, the renewable portfolio standards in the United States have been central to the deployment of, of, of this industry and central to driving, driving down costs. Um, and, uh, and, and similar mandates around the world have helped to bring down costs for this industry. Um, we all know that. Uh, Renewable power does not um, r result in the emissions of local air pollutants or, or greenhouse, gas, uh, greenhouse gases. Fossil fuel-based um, pollutants you know, um, do that. Fossil fuel plants do that. So that's exactly why a price on carbon is the right type of tool. So, so given your adherence to market-based principles, it's, I'm not clear why you're opposed to a carbon price, Jim. Steve, and then, so and then let, me, let me actually. Now, by the way, I did not say I was opposed to a carbon price, uh, although I hate the phrase price on carbon, which we can talk about in a second. Okay. <laughs> solar, solar generation in the United States last year was less than 1%. It was probably less than a half a percent of total electricity generated. Uh, wind is 5%. Wind is going to pass hydro in a year. Solar is going to get 4 or 5%, but it's a very different thing for having 10% intermittent renewables and 50% intermittent renewables. But the intermittent renewables are going to go drop in price, continue to drop in price for the next 30 years. And so that's what I talked about when I said when you make this transition from 10 to 30, 50 percent, uh, there are other costs, real costs with intermittency. But the energy costs still remain the same. They're free. <laughs> so, so the fundamental energy costs. So, so this is where we need to take advantage and plan it. And we have existence proofs of Europe being 30, 40, 50% intermittent. And meanwhile, the US utilities are saying, we can't handle more than 2% solar. Okay, So there have to be new incentives. And I agree with Jim, absolutely. Because the old incentives, the old business plan, play it safe. You have to think a lot harder for in incorporating intermittency than with on demand. And so that incentive of you don't have to do anything, you're guaranteed a return on your investment, play it safe. It's got to change. So I think we're all in agreement there. I, I want to ask about the new incentive, but I don't want to just dominate. I want to get to the audience. So here and then in the back, up front and then in the back. Hello, I'm Glenn Davis. I'm CEO at Renewable Energy Systems Americas. My question is for Dr. Chu. I saw you raised your hand pro-nuclear. If your energy storage project hits its targets, does that answer change? No, the energy storage will electrify personal electrification. It can do peak load shifting. It can do day night. It's not going to do much for summer winter. It's not going to do much for one month or two months of bad weather. And so we still will need on-demand energy for hiatuses of months. And, 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 and that's not only in the United States, because we actually have some of the best renewables, and we're geographically dispersed. But if I look at Europe, and I look at Japan, and I look at Korea, you know, I, I don't see how you're going to get anything except you need energy on demand sources. Is, well, well, well is, go ahead. Nu nuclear is a baseload technology. So if you're going to apply nuclear to an on demand, fill in the gaps around uh, renewables, what's already a challenging set of economics around renewables in a subsidy free environment. In fact, if you take subsidies away, nuclear is the first thing that's going to fall off the map. Now you're trying to use a technology that has challenging economics as a baseload unit in an environment, an economic approach that is going to kill it. 
Yeah, well, so let me, let me pipe in here, okay? As I said, we need to simplify the mandates and make them market-based and eliminate the subsidies. If I've got a market-based mandate, I don't need to subsidize anything. The market's got to deliver the environmental performance like it does for every other market-based mandate we've ever done the environment. And we've done it on SO2, on NOx. We've done it on fisheries. I mean, I can go through the list. We know how to do it, okay? And I don't need the taxpayer to cross-subsidize that. The market's going to find that. And by the way, I can build a lot of nuclear against a clear market signal about where my carbon trajectory is in a market-based mandatory system. All right, so I'm not worried about that. In terms of your question then on, on, um, on, on the other components of storage and batteries, just look at France, okay? France at 80% nuclear, 20% you know, renewables with a little bit of slop, slop in there. We already know how to do it. It's been done, okay? Now, I want to move to transportation though. I, I want to get a lot of this, these electrons and these other sources in transportation. And this is where this becomes fundamental. These numbers are huge. I mean, we're, not, we're, we're barely scratching the surface of what's needed, so it's going to be a long time before the problem you described is a problem, even if I got to 80% nuclear. I still have a ton of, of, of alternative transportation infrastructure to support, as well as to support the operation of the electric grid. Just have to point out that France is a great example, but they are France, and it's, I'm not sure how relevant that is to how we move, move off the We should be here. embarrassed. But, uh, but uh, yeah, no, I'm just saying it's, yeah, back here. Record, but I know that one of the most significant things that came out of Paris was the recognition that we could do all the renewables we want, we're still going to have to remove carbon that's already in the atmosphere. And therefore, I find it strange that in reporting that, I find that probably the most significant thing came out, the recognition that the lifetime of carbon in the atmosphere is much longer than the scientists thought, and therefore, no matter what we do in renewables within any reasonable scenario, really the massive challenge is to remove the CO2 that's already put in there. And that gets back to my previous comment, that it seems to me we have to think about how we monetize that CO2 at the same time that we sequester it. Unless we find a pathway that both enables us efficiently to take carbon that's already in the atmosphere, do it in an economic way, and at the same time sequester it, with all these renewable things are not going to prevent even a worse scenario than Steve talked about. So I was wondering how you thought that often neglected component, which is sort of recently uh, permeated into the reality, gets promulgated so people are more aware of it and don't continue the same old story that we can get there by renewables. Very quick answer from Steve, and I want to give you guys a last word because we got to Peter, wrap. I agree absolutely that uh, carbon capture is an essential part of the path forward. In the long term, we're going to have to capture carbon. We're going to have to use very inexpensive clean energy to split water, combine hydrogen with carbon, and make liquid hydrocarbons. In the medium and short term, we've got to improve the technologies uh, to lower the cost of capturing carbon, first from point sources, but uh, as you are working on, ultimately from the atmosphere. Absolutely has to be part of it. So let me just, uh, we've got to wrap up, I think, but let me just ask each of you, again, kind of, kind of putting this all in perspective, um, and won't ask for a number. The president is pledging 26 to 28 percent reductions uh, by 2025. Jim, you said just get me going down. When you look out 10 years, do you are you raise your hand if you're highly confident the U.S. will have significantly reduced its carbon emissions? Significantly? No, uh, so that's, double that's digits, a big more upward. than double digits. Um, I don't think policy will take us to our goal, but markets might as we saw with the shale gas revolution, so, which gave us a huge leap forward, yeah. almost gave us unfair credit, uh, because if you, say, if you think that only policy drives these outcomes, it was unfair. Now, I think that's a perfect solution. So that's an example. So I think there's a reasonable probability we're going to succeed despite ourselves. Because okay? of markets. Because of markets. But it's not fast enough and it's not cheap enough. Right. Okay? And so I'd still like that 20, 40-year signal right. to say where society expects our emissions to, to be. Get a number. Yep. Against which then I can create lots of markets as well as policy instruments. 15 seconds, David and Steve. What makes you optimistic? M markets matter a lot. Policy matters hugely in this space as well. A lot will turn on the results of this next presidential election. Uh, I'll return to technology. He sees market and, and, and cheap natural gas. I see technology. I, I'm pulling for both. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's join. Our, please join us in congratulations. <laughs>